All right, so I'll just start in with my moderator bit. If you see me looking down, I just have everything written down on my phone. Normally I have notes. Um, so uh, my name is Elizabeth Hurst. I'm the author of The Face in the Marsh from Renaissance Press. I will be your moderator today. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I would like to acknowledge that this panel is hosted on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. Uh, we're in Hamilton, <laughs> or at least I am. Uh, and uh, before I present our panelists, I would just uh, like to let everyone know if you have a question, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat. Uh, we're going to be using the chat to put helpful links for all of our uh, panelists. And so um, we want to keep that available for people. So the Q&A is where we will be taking questions. Um, so further to that, um, I'm just going to have the panelists only discussing until the last 15 minutes. It will be open for questions and uh, we'll be able to hear what everyone has to say and uh, that's when we'll be uh, having the audience discussion and also so uh, my moderation style is I'm going to have every panel every panel participant I uh, talk once about every question and then we'll move on to the next question so that everybody has a has a chance to talk um, and I'll start with a different person every time. <laughs> so uh, let's see. And don't forget to visit our visit dealer's room to uh, check out the panelists' books and chat on the Discord server. Um, it's really great. We're getting some of that convention social fun, um, which I've re been really missing. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I think that's about it. So at this point, I would like to invite the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, so I am seeing S.L. Huang on my left here, so I'm going to start with you. <laughs> Sounds good. Hi, uh, my name is S.L. Huang, and uh, I, uh, I am the author of the Cass Russell series from Tor Books, starting with Zero Sum Game. They are sci-fi thrillers about an anti-heroine who can do math really, really fast and uses it to kill a lot of people, as you do with math. Um, I'm also the author of Burning Roses, upcoming this year, which is about Red Riding Hood and Hoi the Archer as two queer middle-aged women shooting at things. I might have a, a brand with that. Um, I'm really excited to be here, and um, I would also like to acknowledge that uh, I grew up on the land of the Lenni Lenape, and I currently live and work on the land of the Kikapu, Peoria, Potawatomi, Menominee, Miami, and Sioux Nation. Excellent. Uh, let's go with Brian next. I think you're muted, though, Brian. Yeah, just give me a moment. I mean myself. I'm oh, Brian sure. McNett. I'm a writer of short fiction and an anthologist living in Bremerton, Washington, the traditional land of the Fort Madison band of the Suquamish. Uh, they actually happen to be our, our county's large, uh, third largest employer. Wow, that's cool. Thank you, Brian. Jennifer? Hi, I'm Jennifer Lee Rossman. I live in Binghamton, New York, which is the land of the Onondaga people. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a writer of science fiction fantasy, and I've also co-edited two anthologies, one of them with Brian. Hi, Brian. Um, and if you see me move my body like this or something, I'm just trying to readjust myself because I have muscular dystrophy. And if you see me looking in the background, it's because you're right against my fish tank and I get distracted easily. <laughs> also, I am a gay tornado made of sharks. I was told to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Steven? Hi, I am Stephen Graham King. Uh, I, uh, my pronouns are he or they, whichever. Uh, I am a writer of queer space opera. Uh, uh, I, my books are, uh, my first novel was Chasing Cold, and since then I've been working on my Maverick Heart series, uh, which uh, three books are available, and I just found out today that book four has been picked up by Renaissance, so yay me. Uh, uh, I, I don't know what else to tell you. Um, there you go. I'm on the spot that I write stuff. <laughs> Okay, so that's all wonderful. Thank you for introducing yourself. Um, so my first question is an easy one. Um, what works have inspired you with their 
conceptions of queer futurism. So, Stephen, I know we talked about this before, and I feel like you're going to have a, a you know, you, you've got some ideas here. So let's start with you. <laughs> um, I the things the ones that came to me today when I was thinking about the late, late newer works, um, the N.K. Jemisin, uh, the Broken Earth, uh, which had amazing integral organic queer representation. Um, a series that surprised me was Tim Pratt's Actium trilogy, which someone recommended to me as as just you know fun space opera, and the main character, the captain of the ship is a woman who has an ex-husband who falls in love with another, with a woman during the course of the first book. So it was just this, again, effortless integration of queer characters. Um, the Becky Chambers, uh, hers are fantastic. Um, you can go back, uh, like historically, there's so many things throughout the years, but those are the newest ones that have, have struck out to me as being part of that what I like to call everyday queerness, where, where queer people are just there and part of the world. And it, it's, it's not a, it, it's not, the books aren't about queerness. They are about people and adventures and stories and, and plots, but queer people are there and present um, in, in ways that, you know, many years ago they would not have been. Yeah, I'm super glad you especially uh, mentioned the Broken Earth trilogy, because that's one of the ones that really popped to mind for me as well. So uh, let's move on to Jennifer now. Hey, um, I really loved Torchwood's, like everyone is bisexual kind of thing because it's, they're battling aliens and things that are so out of this world and it's just normal to be gay. And it's like in Winona Earp, it's just the like, gay is just there and it's awesome. And my group, housemate is screaming next door, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, like in Killjoys, there's all these big tough space guys. One of them is in love with the guy who owns the bar. Like, it's not about that. Just like what Stephen was saying, it's not about it, but it's there and it's so in the world. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. That's, that's a really cool thing that science fiction can do. Um, Brian. Oh dear. <laughs> I come somewhat, somewhat unprepared. Uh, one, of the, one of the pieces of fiction that's really inspired me was uh, Vonda McIntyre's Starfarers. Uh, she did a really, really just excellent job. And you have the, the uh, the one character, and I, I think he's sort of understated because it's sort of, you know, uh, given that he's uh, bisexual, but he's the most normal character in terms of his sexuality in the entire story. <laughs> and you have this uh, sort of polyamorous grouping, which is, you know, there, it's just there. It's not something they make a big deal out of. It's background to the story rather than central to the story. I have to say some of my favorite, you know, science fictional or just generally fictional queer situations also involve polyamory and alternative families. That's like one of my favorite like oh, yeah. little pet topics is, is alternative families of various types, whether that regular, like found family or platonic family or poly family, it just it fascinates me, it always has. So uh, let's move on to SL. Uh, it's interesting you were just talking about that, different types of families, because that's exactly what I was going to uh, bring up. I also love stories where we have characters who are queer and it's part of their character, but it's not, uh, necessarily like what the book is about or driving the plot in some way. Um, obviously, I also love stories about queerness, but we just need all of it. But I also, you know, uh, as uh, I'm sure all, all of us here on the panel would agree, like queerness is not just about, you know, who you love or who you bang. It's also about like 
family connections and um, different types of, and uh, uh, gender and different types of relating to people um, that might be non-traditional. And uh, I, I love it when books don't just say, oh, well, this is, this is a future where it's totally fine to have, you know, same sex nuclear family units, <laughs> but also imagine worlds that, that expand along other axes um, in terms of relationships. Um, and uh, what one series I think does that very well, and uh, it's weird that I'm recommending it here as like positive representation because it's such a depressing, like terrible world, but is Yoon Ha Lee's Machineries of Empire series, which I love. Um, but he, he, the way he does the world building is very, um, it's, it doesn't kind of spoon feed it to you. So it's, it's very hinted at. And you see all these edges of all these different family structures uh, where there's a mention of like, oh, one of her mothers or something, you know, like where you don't necessarily even know what all of these connections might be, but you see that there are so many possibilities. Um, another book I want to mention uh, that I, I read very recently that is amazing is River Solomon's The Deep, um, which has uh, uh, an entire uh, society of, um, of people who are uh, not human, but are descended from humans, from the, the slaves who are thrown overboard uh, during uh, the, the slave trade. And um, the, the way that Rivers approaches gender with them and family and is uh, just so incredible. Um, and uh, so I would really recommend that. Um, there's also like an incredible amount of um, great exploration of queerness, I think, going on in the short story space, like in short fiction. Um, J.Y. Mian Young, uh, uh, Merck Dunmore, uh, Merck Ben Wolfmore um, and uh, uh, Kellen Spara. A lot of people are doing like some incredible work there. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm <laughs> so many people that I love reading. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, no, I, I love it when we have so many people to talk about. And actually, I'm so glad you brought up River Solomon because I loved um, her other book, the science fiction. I'm gonna look back here because I have it on my bookshelf. What's it called? Uh, I, I have the deep right here. Quick correction, Rivers' pronouns are they, them, um, and their fiction is amazing. I completely agree. And, yeah, I apologize. Uh, I did, I for, sorry, I forgot her pronoun. Oh, sorry, sorry. All right. And I'm kindness of ghosts. And I'm yes, kindness of yes. ghosts. That's the one. All right. <laughs> I hope, I remember the whole plot and I forget the title. <laughs> yes. Um, their work is amazing. I absolutely love that. It was such a beautiful book from beginning to end. It was just a pleasure to read. Um, and yeah, I mean, as far as, as far as it goes for me, it's not a book, but I've just, I want to talk about She-Ra. <laughs> I love She-Ra so much on a, it was so healing on a number of axes for me because I grew up watching Sailor Moon and Sailor Moon was like my big thing when I was, you know, from probably age 10 to age 14 and I saw bigotry basically not allow them having Sailor Uranus and Neptune having their actual relationship, you know, on screen. And I saw people do that. And it was really actually sad and traumatic for me. I didn't, I didn't know why at the time, but it was just seemed like such a horrible shame that they did that to such a beautiful show. And like, yeah, so that happened. But then she seems like this sort of repair of that, you know what I mean? Because now we've got... I'm not going to be spoilers, but we have so many different, you know, diverse same-sex and queer relationships on screen in the show. And just on a very side note, they had like body positivity as well, you know, where all different bodies are represented. I think that's kind of connected to queerness too, because I love Glimmer. <laughs> I love Glimmer so much because I've literally never seen someone on television who's competent and a hero with my body type, which is short and pear shaped. <laughs> so like, I, I'm like, what, what, no, what? This is a princess on a television show? You know, when I first saw her and I just started rolling with it and it was just this, this amazing experience. But anyway, she -Ra. Um I also did an article on queerness in horror. Um, last year and just kind of verging into that a little bit i mean i love let the right one in if you haven't read that the writing is just so like clear and visceral um it's an older one and this is i'll actually have to thank nathan for this one 
um, Drawing Blood by Poppy Z. Bright. Um, I also really enjoyed that one, and that one has gay characters in it, and I thought that it was really fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah, that's me. Um, let's move on to our next question. Just checking my notes. So, on the opposite end of things, are there any tropes that really annoy you when we have queer characters in science fiction or speculative fiction? So who haven't I started with yet? Have I started with everybody? Yep. Okay. All right, so we end with you, SL, so I think we're gonna go back to you. Okay, um, right. yes, there are so many. <laughs> Um, one of the ones that really uh, gets me the most is when queerness is used as a proxy for uh, promiscuity or uh, uh, breakdown of society in some way. Um, I feel bad about the way I said, just said that because there's nothing wrong with promiscuity, um, but it's also not, it's certainly not equivalent to queerness in any way. They're totally different things, you know. Um, I think the worst offender in this that I've read is The Forever War, which uh, I don't know if any of you have read it, but it um, sort of frames a society that has become completely like where every, everybody's now in gay relationships as being like a, a huge breakdown in society that the main character returns to. And then the, the worst ending possible in which one of the main characters like sees the light and gets like treatment to become straight again. It's like I. It, I almost like threw that book against the wall so many times, but I was kept hoping it would get better. And it just like, it made me so upset for so long after reading it. Um, and I, I feel like this is, this is seen a lot uh, more in perhaps older fiction. I think we're, we're getting better about it, but it's certainly something that I saw a lot when I was younger that um, it, it has been very frustrating. Yes, that's, I was, I was kind of going, oh no, as <laughs> you're saying that because that sounds terrible. Um, Brian, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh God, I don't even know where to begin with this one. Uh, yeah, not really prepared to answer this question. Do you want me to do you want me to move on or yeah go ahead and move on to the next yeah absolutely um yeah. let's go jennifer hmm. um for me it's when um the like when it's the alien is the weird third gender and that's the way they frame it um because it's only the aliens or it's only the robots that are the asexual characters usually only the robots that are autistic too. And so for me trying to, like I'm on the asexual spectrum, it's weird for human characters to be like that. It's normal for aliens. Well, I don't get humans to look up to um, when only the aliens are the ones that like, um, I'm thinking on, um, on the Orville, the two aliens that are both males, because there's very few males and or females in their genders and their species, they would never have that as a human story. They would never have just like, oh, our baby is a girl. This is the problem for us as humans because it's weird for humans to not have the quote unquote correct genders or sexualities. It's, that bothers me. Yeah, that can be used in a really dehumanizing way. And yeah, there should be, it should be a lot more normalized that, you know, there are characters who are asexual or, or autistic or, you know, just, just generally kind of, especially with the opting out of, of sexuality. I think that's very punished, you know, in our society a lot of times and seen as other. And it's just not, it's a normal human thing that happens to many people. Um, Stephen. Sort of following through on, uh, on uh, something that both SL and Jennifer, so this sort of uh, ties in a little bit. The, it's another thing that we haven't, we're seeing a lot less of and we haven't seen in a long time. Uh, I'm, I'm just older, so I remember it, is 
when that the, the things that were used as metaphors for queerness, you know, it's like it's the last taboo, the love between a human and a robot. It's like, no, we don't need to do human, robot, human, alien, human, vampire. We don't, we don't need that anymore. I mean, go back again, I'm dating myself, but the, the next generation episode where they supposedly tackled qu the queerness and it was the, the, a gender asexual alien species and the, the, the poor brave w brave being came out as being a straight woman you know that was their the only way that they i mean granted it was the time it was the only way they could do it in that media but but i think we're we can leave that behind now we can tell queer stories we can tell like i said the everyday queerness stories we can tell the near future stories about how we get to these better futures that we're working for. We can, we, we can be present now. We don't need to be a metaphor for something. We don't need a, a stand-in appearing for us in the stories that people can just sort of go, oh, I get it. But like I say, we can, we can be present now. We can be in the stories. We can be the heroes of the stories. We can be the psychic. We can be all of that, but we don't need to be hidden behind that layer of science fictional metaphor anymore uh which i like i said it's it's not happening nearly as much as it did thank goodness uh, because of the voices of modern writers who are uh, who are are queer or even who aren't and are integrating queer characters well into the stories that they tell and that's true and i mean i think that i think that you know pandering to a homophobic and queerphobic audience isn't really necessary anymore. Um, you know, and, and I think that sometimes the impulse, you know, they don't want to offend anybody, which, you know, I, I want to, I want to quote, I want to quote Avi from the, uh, the, the mental health panel earlier when she said, you know, if your book is offending someone, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Because folks that offend nobody aren't doing anything, you know, and I agree, <laughs> absolutely agree. Um, okay, so let's try another one. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, Stephen, uh, I'm going with uh, your question that you submitted for the panel. So, um, it's important to delineate the difference between queerness being used as a device, metaphor, or SF con a concept, and having queer characters existing in future settings that don't revolve around queerness. What are the key advantages and disadvantages of these two distinct ways of using queerness in science fiction? And how can changing the format in this way affect the discourse? And if anybody needs any clarity on that question, just, just ask, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> I phrased it, so, you know, hopefully I'll be the person who can translate it. <laughs> there, were, <laughs> there, were, there were a couple of things that, that occurred to me, a couple of works that occurred to me today that sort of like, they're the, for me, the flip side of the, bad fake queer metaphor thing. They are works that I don't think set out to be a queer metaphor. However, in the nature of the world building, they can be seen as it as queer metaphor in a good way. And that was the uh, Anne Leckie's ancillary series, which basically it revolves around a culture in which the gender neutral pronoun which is applied to everyone is she her so literally every character that you encounter is referred to as she her so you literally at any time do not know the gender of any of the characters that you're reading about and so i found as i was reading it this sort of sensation of okay trying to figure out from their personality traits and their actions and the way they interacted with the other characters. And then doing this sort of backwards double take of, okay, well, I've equated that with masculine or feminine. Why did I, what did, and so this constant kind of second guessing, except for like this, I think there's one instance where there's something that marks a character as being male bodied. But for the most part, you literally spend your entire time reading this book thinking, 
You know, the, 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 you, I have no idea of the gender. So, so I think it unintentionally, I don't think it was because she set out to write about people being un, ungendered or, or, or that sort of thing, but, but just sort of turned it around and thought it was a great idea in terms of building a world that makes you see the work on these whole other levels as you're reading it. And the other one that came to mind for me was Murderbot by Martha Wells, um, which is about this combat cyborg who is sort of assigned to, to do security for various people, who rewrites its own software so that it, it has free will and can do what it wants. But because it's a combat cyborg. It, most of the body has been rebuilt. It doesn't need sexual characteristics or gender. So that's all erased. So it goes through these entire, these entire stories um, with this kind of attitude about like people and their bodies and their sexual, they just not really understanding any of it and not really wanting to understand any of it. And again, you're dealing with this absence of gender which was not in not i don't think done intentionally just it's a logical extension of the world that she's built and the fun thing that i found was that when i read it i think partially because the author's a woman the book is in first person my brain read the character as having maybe been originally female where my sister read the book and read the character as male so uh, they're, they're not works that specifically, I think, are intentionally dealing with those things, but just those metaphors can be seen in the material because the ideas and the concepts that the authors put in are so rich. So I think that, again, it, you know, that's sort of like the flip side of the everyday people are just where people are just there. There are ways that you can see those things through another lens, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I find it really intriguing that, you know, uh, a, a choice of pronouns would, um, you know, kind of send us into this interesting conceptual space where, you know, we're no longer seeing traits as gendered, which is really, you know, very interesting. Um, definitely. I just want to send out a very, a very quick apology to Avi. Um, her pronouns are they, them. Um, I apologize, Avi. I wanted to showcase your brilliance. <laughs> okay. Um, so moving on to Jennifer. I think sometimes a metaphor is the easiest way to explain things to people who aren't going to get it. You can't just go up to a straight person and say, so you know how it sucks when people don't like you because you like women? And they're like, no. But you, like Aesop's fables kind of thing. You put completely different characters in situations that you can relate to. And then it acclimates people to new ideas without it being big, scary new ideas. It's just slightly different than what they're used to. And then... I don't know if it makes them more open, but that's the idea, I think. I don't have examples to draw from, I'm sorry. No, that's cool. That's cool. No, I definitely think you're right there, though. Um, Brian? Yeah, um, what Jennifer said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, she and I are pretty much on the same wavelength on this one. Uh, oftentimes, it's difficult as, as someone who doesn't experience sexual attraction doesn't really have much interest or really desire uh, to have interest. Uh, it's, it is a little difficult. It's like, it's like Stephen says, all these uh, metaphors and really I, I would like some straight out representation in fiction. <laughs> uh, uh, but sometimes it's hard to go with that straight out representation people don't understand. They're expecting, they have expectations that aren't in line with this particular type of queerness. And I think that's about all I can say on that. For sure. And I think I don't always 
I don't always like the mixing of literary fiction with science fiction and fantasy. I think sometimes it can get, you know, I, I think sometimes the authors can want to distance themselves from some of the more fun and, you know, fanish aspects of the genres. And, and also, you know, it can get, you know, it, it, some, it doesn't always work well, but one of the ways I think we could benefit from a little more literary philosophy in science fiction and, and fantasy worlds is the breaking of expectations and having people go into the story, maybe having the expectation that they're not going to get a romance subplot. They could go off in this really interesting new direction with found family or, you know, that things are going to take an interesting, unexpected turn um, the way a lot of literary fiction can. Um, this is one of the things I love most about literary fiction, having done a, a master's of English, is that I think what it gave to me is that I learned that rules are made to be broken. And, you know, um, maybe if if more readers approach science fiction and fantasy with the rules are made to be broken kind of literary stance, then it would, it, you know, we'd be able to kind of advance those more. SL, let's hear what you have to say. Um, uh, I want to do, if it's okay, a, a really brief aside on the pronouns thing, because this fascinates me uh, as somebody who uh, uh, has, comes from a few different cultures myself and has lived uh, in other countries and speaks a few languages. It, where, there are languages and cultures that have pronouns that are gendered significantly differently from English. Um, not necessarily non-gendered societies either. Uh, for example, um, if you look at Chinese society, um, it, is, it is definitely not ungendered. Um, but the, the spoken pronouns and um, in, historically the written pronouns were the same for male and female. Um, and this is, so if anybody's sort of interested in, in looking into what Stephen was saying with how pronouns affect, you know, how we perceive things and, you know, the interaction with like how we look at gender, um, I find it uh, really fascinating to sort of look at that in a, in a multicultural way and dig into translation stuff um, because it's exactly what you're saying, Stephen, that like there's, there's some really, it, it makes us like sort of aware of things about ourselves, I think, and about how we how we think yeah. about gender. Um, that uh, you know, maybe if we spoke in English all our lives, as I have, um, is not uh, you know as a parent. Um, as for the metaphor question, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was on a, a panel a while ago with it was 100% queer authors, and uh, we got this question about is there still room for those metaphor stories where um, and every other author on the panel said that they didn't want any more of them that 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 personally they were they were just kind of over that as a uh but um i i do think there's still room for them especially from queer authors because i think sometimes we do still need that i apologize there's a siren outside um and uh i i think um you know some of what you know steven and jennifer were saying about like sometimes it's a way to help people understand. And that can be especially more true even within um, certain, I guess, uh, um, sub demographics of queerness, because, you know, uh, quilt bag is very, very large, right? And, and encompasses a lot of different identifications of gender and sexuality and, and the way we interact with the world. And some of those are, you know, more well known or and more well understood than others. And even, you know, talking to, um, it, when queer people are talking to each other, you know, when I'm in queer communities, sometimes we do have to, uh, you know, we do find ourselves not understanding each other's experiences. Um, and of, of course, you know, we're all very open to learning and, and talking to each other about it. Um, but I think there, there is still space, especially for when queer authors want to tell those stories and use metaphor, um, that can be done very powerfully still. And, uh, and I, I still want to read those myself. Can I just throw one quick point in? Yes, uh, uh, just amplifying something you said, Liz, as, as well, is one of the best pieces of advice I ever got from a writer was from Nalo Hopkinson, who basically said to me, you can do whatever you want as long as you know why. So it can be a metaphor story, it can be a, a queer story, you can, but you have to know what your reason is for, for telling the story in that way, in the same way that you decide the details of how the world works and where it is and what people's names are. You need to know the why 
of what of what this well, why the story is that way and why you need to tell it that way. So yes, I, I I think there's definitely room for metaphor stories. There's room for so many different things because those those stories belong to somebody and and that person who's writing the story has a reason why they need to tell it. So there's so much room for that. It's just uh, the the piece of radio eyes is like just know why just know why that you want it you need it to be that way i, I agree and uh, i do want to emphasize though which i think we've all said in one way or another that we also do need on the page human representation <laughs> um and I, I i think we all completely agree on that um but yeah i, I agree with you Stephen. yeah i want to put a pin on that uh, you know know why you're doing it that's that's like that's a quotable right there. <laughs> um, SL, that was fascinating about the Chinese verbs, or the Chinese pronouns, I mean. Um, that, I would like to hear more about that. I think uh, other people would like to hear more about that. So if you have any links or, or further information. Oh. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's very <laughs> easily, easily Googleable. Any, yeah. you know, anything you look up about the Chinese language. But if people are interested, I'll, I'll bring up a, a little more. Um, the Japanese language, for example, um, uh, which I, I speak about as well as Chinese, that is to say, not extremely well, <laughs> but uh, um, also genders differently. Um, for example, the uh, first person pronouns are gendered in Japanese. Um, so when you're referring to yourself, uh, you're choosing a potentially gendered pro pronoun. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and although they do have third person gendered pronouns, Japanese often very naturally avoids using third person pronouns altogether. Um, so, for example, if you, um, you know, gender queerness and, and non-binary genders are uh, just starting to be part of the, uh, the conversation um, in, in Japan, you know, when I, when I talk to LGBT uh, circles there. Um, and um, the, uh, what, what, one thing I've heard is that it's actually, when speaking Japanese, it's a lot harder to not misgender yourself than it is to have other people not misgender you. Because people are usually using a third person pronoun for you. So you get misgendered a lot less, but then you have to make some like very difficult and sometimes, you know, come out in interesting way, you know, when you're talking about yourself and using the first person. Um, and uh, so there are, and, and if you look up in particular, like how other languages have started talking about, um, you know, neo pronouns and in, in contemporary times, um, and how uh, 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 the different ways that different languages are addressing them. Um, for example, um, there are a lot of languages where, for example, all nouns and adjectives are gendered. Um, and linguistically, it's more like categorized and then the, the, the categories are called by genders. Um, you know, obviously a table is not male or female. But if you, uh, but uh, of course this doesn't, uh, w w when, a, when a person is, you know, wanting to um, uh, have their correct pronouns used and the correct gendering of the adjectives that apply to them, um, of course, it, it, it becomes like a very uh, important social thing to, you know, be able to have gender uh, neutral ways of talking about things. Um, so, for example, uh, if you look at like romance languages, um, that's another uh, very interesting linguistic exploration uh, you can look at um, and the, the, the queer activism that's going on in a lot of these other countries. Um, and the, the ways that we use language to refer to ourselves as queer people and in queer communities. Thank you, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go look that up. Uh, so it looks like it's almost time to turn everything over to the Q&A. I just wanted to add one more thing based on what Stephen had said and about what everybody was saying about, you know, metaphor. And yeah, I think there's still a place for metaphor too. Um, I wrote, my book, The Face in the Marsh is about being by and partially even though it's fictional you know it's based on my part of partially on my struggle coming out as by and I definitely have some metaphor in there um I have a faceless monster who is trying to gain a human face and I'm using it as a metaphor for the closet so you know um that, that just kind of rang true for me because I think in that case I'm hoping someone's going to see that metaphor and be like, oh, that's my interior life right there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, that's probably, I can, I hope there's more metaphor like that out there, um, too. Uh, so I'm going to move over to the Q&A now and just see what we have from the audience. So, okay. Ah, okay, so Danielle Ray asks, 
how do you navigate the ground where a queer character is also some kind of monster, anti-hero, or villain? So, we haven't started with Brian in a while. Let's start with Brian. Uh, yeah, it's, um... <sighs> a queer character who's also some kind of monster, anti-hero, and villain. This is one of those tropes that, uh, you know, personally, I try to avoid. Uh, I, I don't want a queer character to be synonymized with the villainous character. Now, if we want to go more in the anti-hero direction, uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, if you have someone who is more sympathetic than the pure villain, uh, that can certainly be part of who that character is. But yeah, in general, I, it's, it, is, it is a kind of sticky little morass of, you know, you don't want to cast your only queer character as the villain in the piece. Uh, try to do more than that would, would be my answer to that question. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to just, uh, I, I had something that I really want to say, but I'm just going to jump in here. <laughs> um, I actually really liked how Downton Abbey handled this. I know it's not speculative fiction, but I forget the name because I haven't watched it in about two years, but there's an under butler who is gay and he is a jerk. Like he's awful to everyone throughout the entire, you know, he's totally self-serving. He's hoarding rations during the war and trying to resell them at a profit. He's just totally amoral, out for himself, not a nice person. And you slowly find out that he's gay as well. You find out he's not a nice person before you find out he's gay. And the way they roll it out, you kind of learn that because he was kicked out of the house, you know, he people didn't understand him. He'd had to hide who he is from a very young age. He felt like no one else was going to have his back. And so in the end, he gets really sick and he recovers and he realizes, hey, the other servants do have his back and they don't really care, you know, as much as he thought they would. And he kind of turns around. But I mean, I would say he was a villain of Downton Abbey. And I would say that that was handled sensitively because he was doing it because he felt isolated. Steven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that, that following through to, to, to both of your points, I think the important thing is A, the evil queer character is not the only queer character, the, the only one that you present as being part of the story. And I, the other thing I think like that, that Downton Abbey story is that what used to happen for so many years is that, that queerness was equated with evil or weakness or, or, you know, psychological damage. So the, the, the queer character was automatically broken, evil, damaged, whatever. Where, like you're saying in that storyline, that the negative qualities of his character were not because he was queer, it was because of when he was queer and the, the world's reaction to him and the way he was forced to live in that world. So it, it, the, the evilness and the queerness were not inextricably tied together in terms of one causing the other. They were a symptom of the world around him. So it, you, I think you can have queer villains, queer antiheroes, all of those things. Again, as long as they're not the only one and, and, and as long as that sort of one-to-one -one equivalency isn't there, I think that's the, those are the most important things to consider. Definitely, that's a great point to make. Uh, let's go with SL. Um, I, I, I definitely agree with everything uh, all of you have said, and I think it needs to be uh, done sensitively um, and be aware of those things like Stephen was saying about not being equated with it, et cetera. But I also like have a lot of fears about us going too far the other direction because some of the best characters are the most evil or complicated or, you know, gray anti-hero. And I, this was actually something I started to notice first with female characters, because I, I, I began to notice that people were so concerned about getting their female characters right, 
about making like the strong female character who is uh, also flawed and not a Mary Sue, um, and also, you know, uh, was able to have, you know, a sex life, but like, wasn't, that wasn't all her character. You know, they were trying to check every single box about having like a good character and, and not stereotyping women that I started to see, and especially like in, in uh, perhaps more beginning writers when I was, you know, uh, in a lot of crit groups and stuff, people would end up sucking all of the life out of their female characters because they were so concerned about not doing anything offensive. And uh, that's a problem too. You know, I like, I, I, I completely agree that we don't want to be having like the, you know, the evil lesbian as like a, a stereotype, right? But at the same time, I don't want us to be robbed of having the really cool, interesting villains either, because those are some of the best characters in science fiction and fantasy, you know, is the, the amazing villains and the amazing anti-heroes. Um, so, you know, I, I do try to take some risks with that in my own work and make my characters have these sharp edges to them. Um, and I, I'm sure I will get something wrong at some point and that will be, you know, that something problematic that I didn't see in the way that I didn't want to sand my characters down. Um, but I, I just think that's also so important. So um, uh, yeah, uh, all types of characters, um, but with a lot of awareness <laughs> is what I would say. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think, I think we're reaching a point where we do want to see those really charismatic kind of anti-hero characters and, and, you know, characters that are just fascinating. And I think at a certain point when you don't let a queer person be a villain, it, it starts to become, why not? You know, once we have enough representation. And Jennifer, what do you have to say about this? Everyone else has made all the points that I was going to make. Oh, so no. I will just say, why do we need straight villains at all? Why do we need straight characters? <laughs> if more people are writing more gay characters, queer characters, there's, it's more okay if they're the villain because it's not always them. And also, like, and you said about um, villains and monsters, queer people love monsters. I'm wearing Mothman earrings right now. Like, it's okay to let us like the cool, scary things as long as it's not the only representation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think we have time for one more question. So let me just pop back into the Q&A chat for a minute. Ooh, I want to do this one. This is a this is going to be a controversial one. Is bad representation better than no representation? Hmm, I want to hear people think about this. Jennifer, let's give you first crack at it. I want to say yes, because like I only ever saw gay characters and straight characters growing up. If there was even a bad representation of a bisexual character, maybe I would have figured it out myself earlier, but then you don't want someone's first experience with a character like them to be negative. So it is very complicated. Um, I would say representation is good, gotta make sure it's not terrible. As long as it's not like harmful, less than perfect is okay. As long as it exists. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so let's move back to Steven. Um, that's, yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, the hope would be that maybe somebody out there would see bad representation and be inspired to do something better. You know, it, it, hopefully that's what would happen, but it's, it, it's tough because depending on who's doing the reading, that bad representation, representation could be damaging. It's, and you could talk for hours about what's worse being invisible or seeing only yourself represented in the in a, a, an unflattering bad way and, and and I don't know that there I don't know that there's an answer to that that's that's hard um, but I think ultimately it's probably it's better to be seen maybe <laughs> 
yeah. that's the best I got. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a many sided issue. <laughs> okay, let's move back over to SL. I honestly think it's a false choice. I don't think we have to choose one or the other. I, I think we can have well researched representation. Like any any writer out there, there's so many resources now. Like uh, put your all into researching this and talking to people, listening to to queer people, reading our fiction and our nonfiction. And uh, you know, I don't I don't think it has to be one or the other. Um, I feel like that's asking: Is it better to have unreadably terrible punctuation and grammar, or to use no punctuation and grammar? Like you don't need to do either one of them. Um, I would say at a personal level, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Jennifer and Stephen have said that I tend to get angrier at erasure than I do at bad representation. I get angry at both, um, but I, I think erasure hits me harder and stays with me longer um, uh, because it feels so terrible to be invisible um, in places where we, we really should be, you know, in, in the real world. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think we have to choose one of those. But here's the real question. Is no punctuation just a form of bad punctuation? <laughs> <laughs> there is no representation just a form of bad representation. <laughs> deep thoughts. Oh, we're leaving on some deep thoughts today. <laughs> All right. Uh, Brian, what do you have to say? Um, I'm basically in agreement with everything that everyone has said to this point. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I want to see good representation, uh, bad representation, and especially no representation. As someone who has read science fiction for, for God, as long as I've been reading, uh, you know, and not seeing myself exactly represented not anything that comes, you know, exactly hits itself on the nose, seeing, you know, sort of passing representation. Uh, and, you know, uh, yeah, I want to see good representation, bad representation, representation and, and none at all are kind of, in my book, the same thing. Yeah. Um, from personal experience, I'm going to say that some bad rep representation combined with no representation actually really delayed me coming out of the closet because I knew I was bi from the time I was 11 years old. But And I tried to come out in high school, but I kind of went back in the closet because there was a lot of obnoxious pushback from the few people that I told and it was really scary. And, you know, when you're a teenager, sometimes, you know, it's hard to feel confident and one of the things that I got from a lot of people was, oh, you're bi, you know, porn stars are bi. And of course, this is me. I sit in the, I sit in the abandoned hallways and read fantasy novels all day. <laughs> you know, I'm going, what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Nothing wrong with being a porn star, but that's not me, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, you know, that was, that was all people knew and it was so sexualized. And I just, it made me go, well, that can't be me, you know, because I didn't know anybody who was just a normal person and was out as bi or even a normal person for a long time who was out as gay. You know, I just, it, it would have been really nice to, to meet a real person who was not a stereotype or to see a real person depicted who was not a stereotype. So, I mean, I'm a little on the side of bad representation is as bad as no representation, personally. Um, so we're almost out of time. I just want to thank everybody for their thoughts today. We've had such an enlightening conversation. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with me while I bumble through this, <laughs> this Zoom meeting thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so yay. Um, if you all want to pop over to the Discord server, um, if anybody wants to continue the conversation there, um, we'll be there. Uh, I'll be there. So. Thanks, thanks so much for moderating, Elizabeth. Yay, um, thanks, I have Liz. another. I have another panel awesome. to run to, so okay. I won't be in the Discord. But thank you to yep. the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was so nice meeting you.